Respect was something we tried to teach our children when they were little. You not only had to teach it, but also show it to earn it. This was something I had to learn growing up, but I didn't learn it from my parents. With the weather was very harsh, so my father asked his best friend to move in with us for the winter due to the poor driving conditions on the rural roads. They moved my older sister into my bedroom because her room had two single beds that he and I could use. One night I woke up and saw him and my mother having sex. The next day I asked her about it, and she said that it didn't happen, that I dreamed. Two weeks later I found them again, but this time in my parents' marital bed. The result of their relationship was my younger sister. My mother, to protect herself, made me the family liar. My father raised my half-sister as his own, but began drinking whiskey to numb the pain. I learned quickly and clearly that for most people the truth doesn't matter. She made a difference to me, and to this day I hate liars. I did not approve of them or defend them. To many who knew me, this sometimes made me look like a complete jerk. My only son learned the hard lesson that not talking to me was the worst thing he could have done in his life. Communication with his mother turned small problems into big ones. If she told me first, they became extreme. His mother knew what buttons to push, and it was a tough two years for him, but then he opened up to me. He learned that responsibility was a price he had to pay. He was turning 16 this year and wanted his first car. He was the eldest of the three. My youngest daughter brought home a bad winter cold, which she lovingly passed on to me, so I woke up fighting a coughing fit, flipping through TV channels in search of something worthwhile, when I discovered a new version of the cameras used by police officers. Using my cell phone, I sent a message to my friend asking if there were any models that could automatically forward the current video when it was full to a pre-programmed email address. Two days later he called and told me about a product that did just that, but it wasn't cheap and only worked as intended when a free Wi-Fi network was available. It cost me over $2,000 for three cameras. I told him to deliver them to my office at work along with the new laptop I ordered for personal use. My job at an advertising firm was to oversee all commercial shoots, which meant I was often on remote locations for days at a time. The main shareholders of the company were twin brothers, one gay, the other straight, their names were Robert and Stephen Walker. Stephen was known as a ladies' man and never married. We seemed to get along great. I worked with them for many years and was now making six figures, so my life was going great. While I was away, if my wife needed a companion, Robert, who loved men, was the one to accompany her. This gave him the opportunity to improve his public image. David Peters delivered them to me on Friday afternoon at my office, adding a few additional items for my consideration. The first thing he said was that I needed to set up a cloud mailbox to send videos, so I set up a new account specifically for this. The cameras were no bigger than diamond earrings. They were all motion activated, so he installed one in a set of earrings. They could run for up to a week before needing to be recharged, and this was done wirelessly when a signal was detected. All she had to do was take them off and put them back in the box. Each video camera had its own identification number and showed it with each video sent. He asked me why I needed them. I explained that my instinct told me that something was wrong, but I had no idea what it was. I wanted to see for myself that my suspicions were not justified. I was scheduled to fly out on Sunday evening for my next trip. On Sunday, I gave my wife, Deborah, to whom I have been married for almost 18 years, a gift. It was a pair of diamond earrings that dangled from a stud. She loved them and promised to wear them all the time I was gone. Before heading to the airport, I stopped by the office to pick up a few things I would need. This gave me the opportunity to leave a note at both of my boss's offices that I would call them if there was a problem. I placed one of the cameras in each of their offices to provide an uninterrupted view of their desks. Both of them were directly connected to the required sources. I flew from New York to Whistler on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada, because we were scheduled to shoot a new snowboard commercial for two weeks. Luckily, there was still snow on the upper peaks. I'm not a big person, just 5 foot 9 about 175 cm, 166 pounds about 75 kg, with a 32 inch waist about 81 cm. 
Deborah always says that I should wear baby socks from three to nine years old. Her wrist was thicker than mine. We were the same height, so she never wore heels around me. She had good breasts, besides, it would be difficult for me to handle more than a handful. Her parameters were 36 C 26 36. With long blonde hair, she still attracted the attention of many men, but she always refused them. Our sex life had slowed down while I was home, but was still fairly regular, and it seemed like our children had taken after her family, so I had no reason to doubt. As a precaution, and because we live in the city, we agreed to do DNA tests on our children. We also took their fingerprints and kept them in case something happened to them. On Wednesdays, while I was doing karate, she went to the theater, otherwise we spent all our free time together. Friday was our dinner and dancing night because we both loved to dance. On weekends, whenever possible, we devoted time to our children. Deborah ran her own interior design company from her home, which gave her a good income, and she had a call answering service when she was away from home. There were times when we were both overwhelmed and were both away from home. Both our parents helped us. As a result, our children had deep relationships with both. On Monday evening, I started reviewing the information they sent me after submitting my daily report on the company-provided laptop. Then I opened mine and found three messages. What first caught my attention was the fight between Stephen and Robert. I'm fed up with this, Robert said. Being your muse so you can sleep with Deborah isn't fun anymore. God, if Glenn ever finds out, we're screwed. He does the work of three people, and without his abilities, we will lose millions. Do you know how many customers we will lose if it goes to our competitors? You have to stop right now. I can't, said Stephen. I love her, and according to Deborah, their three children are mine. Jesus, damn it. You're an idiot, said Robert. I'm going to contact our corporate lawyer to see what we can do to protect the firm. If the truth comes out, we're all lost. Glenn will destroy us all, and he will have every right to do so. I ran to the bathroom to throw up. I called my older cousin Gordon, a highly paid divorce lawyer, after getting him out of bed. Let's just say he wasn't happy when I told him what I found out. He told me to send him all the video clips I received, and he would start working on the case. The first thing he wanted to arrange was to obtain a DNA sample from Stephen Walker. The video recordings themselves cannot be used, but transcripts of conversations can be used. He asked me to obtain a copy of my company's HR manual and send it to his office. He also asked me to find a notary to fax him the power of attorney. I'll contact the private investigator we're working with tomorrow. They figure out when, where, and how. It's good that you are in Canada. Your absence will make things easier because their guard will be weakened. If all goes well, it would be a good idea to hand them the documents before your scheduled return. I replied that it should be a little less than two weeks, but could take longer. The next morning I called my assistant, who handled everything I needed to do during filming. I asked her to forward the manual to my cousin's office confidentially. Nora said she would do it and commented, I think you finally learned the truth. After my affirmative answer, she said that she would remain silent for now, but was ready to testify in my favor when necessary. So management knew about this all along. I then contacted our family doctor's office to explain that I needed copies of my children's DNA for the lawyers because I was making a new will. I paid for the service with my credit card. One of the Canadians working with us was able to invite a notary. The rest of the week I just forwarded the videos because I knew my cousin would explain everything. The rest of the week I spent my free time fighting the urge to go to a bar and get drunk. Now I understood my father's pain. On Friday, after setting up everything for the weekend, I took a helicopter to Vancouver and then flew all night back to New York. After renting a car, I parked on the street from the house. I was surprised to see my wife's parents taking our three children. Half an hour later, Deborah came out, immaculately dressed in high heels and a new dress that hugged her body like a silhouette. It emphasized her sensuality. As soon as she left, I turned off the alarm and went into my office to take out what I called 16 years worth of journals. They recorded the dates of each trip, what happened and where I was. 
These magazines have saved me legally more than once. An hour later, I was at Gordon's, sitting in his kitchen discussing what he had learned. A DNA sample was obtained from Stephen, and we were awaiting the results of the comparison. They also discovered a penthouse that the two had owned for 22 years. Neighbors believed they were common law spouses and had evidence that they were both there so often that neighbors thought they worked on weekends and nights. They had a cleaning company clean them twice a week. They had sworn statements that they were common law spouses even before we met. Her company's only client was an LLC that bought and sold inexpensive apartments, then renovated them and sold them as furnished units to new buyers at inflated prices. This company was wholly owned by Stephen Walker. Corporate tax filings showed that Deborah earned more than half a million a year after deductions, but took home less than 80000 My children may not be mine, but are they Stephen's children? This remained to be seen. Since Deborah deceived me, could she have done the same with Stephen? Gordon said my mother was taking the kids the following weekend because I wasn't expected home until Monday at the earliest. We agreed that we would have to destroy this bitch, her lover and company. Once she is in her primary residence, their penthouse, I will remove whatever I see fit from the house. I told him I would be back on Friday evening. He will block all joint cards and empty half of our accounts before they are frozen by court order on the day I return. I returned to Canada to finish filming, working twice as hard. Robert Walker met me at the airport when I got off the plane the following Saturday morning. He was surprised that I finished filming early and was confused because he didn't understand why our meeting couldn't wait until Monday. I carried the company laptop with me. Over a cup of coffee, we talked about the trip and what the editing department needed to do. While we were sitting, a man came up to him and asked if he was Robert Walker. Robert confirmed his identity and the man said he was being notified of service. Before he could say anything, I handed him my laptop, company keys, credit cards, and pulled my resignation letter out of my jacket. I then explained that his brother and my wife were also receiving notifications. His face turned pale and he asked how bad it was. I replied that I was going to any lengths. I have DNA confirming that Stephen is the biological father of all of Deborah's children and mine. Lovers are getting notifications in their penthouse right now. Remind them that they are legally prohibited from coming within 500 feet of my mother, children, and me. I thought Robert was about to pass out. I got up and started to leave. Robert attacked me in rage. Before the airport security approached us, I hit him. Without significant medical expenses, he will no longer be a beautiful boy. My mother and my children greeted me when I arrived and opened the garage. It was difficult to tell my two daughters, along with their brother, that I was not their biological father. My mom lost her cool when I told them that their mother was now with the man who gave birth to them in their love nest. I told them that their relationship predates our marriage. Now you will live with me until the court decides after your interview. The court will consider all three parents' relationships with you before the judge makes a decision. All three were devastated, as was I. Mom heard someone trying to open the door and went to open it. I said no, the external alarm is still on. And I called the police, explaining that I wasn't supposed to be home and someone was trying to break in. They said they were already responding to the silent alarm. I then sent the children upstairs. They opened the outer door. Stephen was breaking through a window on the heavy metal door and putting his hand in to try to remove the chain when the police arrived. After detaining the violators, the police officer knocked and introduced himself. I opened the door to find Stephen and Deborah handcuffed in the back seat of a patrol car. When he said that she claimed to live here, I handed him a copy of the protective order that had been served earlier that morning. He smiled and said it looked like they were both going to jail until they saw the judge. My mother finally accepted that what she did to me all those years ago was wrong. It took seeing what I was facing for her to understand the true cost. Not on me, but on her grandchildren. I'm no better than Deborah, she said. Your father forgave me, but he never was the same. If he hadn't died in a work accident, I can't say we wouldn't be where you are now. Photos of Deborah and Steve were on the front page of the New York Post on Sunday morning, 
as they were escorted to the police station. I gave the court reporter who called the whole scheme of what was happening. I stated that I had to leave the firm because of Stephen's long-term relationship with my wife. It will be published on Monday. A DNA comparison report between my children and the Walker brothers proved they were related. She liked the fact that the president of Walker's advertising violated his established moral principles by interfering with my marriage. The board of directors will decide this issue. Carl and Carla Matthews, my children, and I had a late Sunday dinner at a local restaurant, and then they followed us back to our home. Their grandmother put my daughters to bed so my father-in-law and I could talk in my home office. Dad, I said, Deborah and Steve's relationship started before I even met Deborah. I found out about their relationship when I was in Canada. Then I showed him a video clip of Robert and Steve talking. He shook his head in amazement. It became obvious to me that he had no idea. Then I showed him the documents for the purchase of the penthouse, which was completed two years before the date of our marriage. The apartment was still registered in her maiden name. Crap, Carl shouted. The day you got married, you were already a cuckold. When I saw this clip, I hired a lawyer and a private investigator. Both said it was easy to get the facts about them because they believed they had defended themselves so well that the truth was impossible to find. I said softly, I will not let what happens in my life affect your relationship with your children. I gave him my copies of court documents and background materials. While he was reading them, I walked over and poured us both a large glass of Irish whiskey on the rocks. What hurt him most was reading the conversation when Deborah openly admitted to a mutual friend how her parents, brother and sister, and I had been so easily deceived. Stephen and she jointly decided that I would be the one to raise his children. From the moment Glenn first met me, I knew he would do anything for me. He was so in love with me that he would believe anything. His love made him so blind that he could not see what was right in front of his eyes. It didn't hurt that Stephen, seeing Glenn's natural ability to see the smallest details, made him the go-to guy to supervise the shoot. Steve said the cost of reshoots dropped by 80% when Glenn took over. As a result, the company's reputation and profits increased dramatically. Because Glenn thought our family life was good, he never thought anything was wrong, and he's a great father. Terry, my junior in high school, I'll file for divorce and take him to the dry cleaners. An escort service hired by Stephen's company will be used to frame him. She said with a laugh. I returned and saw my father-in-law crying. How did you get all this? Carl asked seriously. I opened my laptop in front of him, logged into my email account, and opened the latest version from Deborah's camera. I opened the video file and allowed it to play. Steve, this is a fucking mess. I don't know how Glenn found out about it, said Deborah. He claims that you are the father of the children, but he hasn't given us proof of this, so this is still nonsense from his lawyer who is trying to build a case. What we're dealing with is just smoke and mirrors. True, Steve replied, but Glenn did resign and serve Robert on Saturday. Will he serve at the corporate event tomorrow? If he does that, then it will be a shame. We were lucky that the judge let us off with a warning. Right now I need to figure out what to say to the board of directors. I need to move my office, clothes and personal belongings out of the house, so tomorrow I will be looking for a divorce lawyer. I also need to decide what I will tell my parents. I'm saying I need to make it look like it's Glenn who's cheating, not me, and that you're just a friend helping me. Do you think they'll buy it? Steve asked. At the end of the day, we both know your children are mine. They have no reason to doubt me because they have never accused me of anything, so their faith and trust in me is guaranteed. She answered, If I have any doubts, I will start crying. My tears always cause them because I was always a daddy's girl. What about our three children? Do you want them to take my last name after we get married? asked Stephen. When I heard this, I turned off the video because I was almost crying. Deborah's diamond earrings have a built-in camera that charges wirelessly and transmits via Wi-Fi whenever it's full. As long as they are charged and have a signal, information will be transmitted as long as she wears them, I said. 
Carla slipped in and joined us. I offered her a glass of wine, and when she said yes, I left them alone to discuss the situation. I returned just in time to see Carl replay for her the conversation we had heard. Carla's face said it all. Mom said with tears in her eyes, So what is written in the divorce document is true. She cheated, but for how long? Longer than their marriage, Dad said. Our grandchildren were created by our daughter and Stephen. I've seen copies of the DNA report. My daughter Deborah is dead in my eyes. She has turned her back on everything our family has ever stood for. I can't forget it because of the length of time and the amount of lies she spun. We both see that she has no regrets, even if she was discovered. Makes me wonder how many times we have taken the children away so she could sleep freely with her lover. But they are our grandchildren. Carla was crying. I don't want to lose them. Mom, if I get custody of them, you will always have unlimited access to them. I told my dad that before we even started talking. I said to calm her worries. But I suggest you both sue for a court order for unrestricted access to your grandchildren, regardless of who wins custody. You'll have to file a lawsuit against all three of us, but I think it's the wisest thing you can do. So you can tell Deborah that until everything is done, you refuse to take sides. Don't let your emotions cause you to close doors that you can't open later. Carl looked at me and nodded in agreement. Darling, our brother-in-law Glenn will always be family to me. I think his wisdom on this matter is right. He was hurting just as much as we were, but he still put our needs first. Said Carl, as far as we know, she and her lover don't seem to be worried about their children at all. Our daughter has lied to us her entire adult life. Where did we go wrong? I have to ask, when Deborah told us she loved Glenn, was she telling the truth? Mom said. Monday was a busy day for me. I drove my three children to school and then spent time in the office explaining the situation. If my wife had tried to contact the children at school, the police would have found out. My soon-to-be ex found herself a high-priced feminist divorce lawyer and my former employer's firm received service. My father-in-law filed a lawsuit against both Deborah and me on Wednesday. He said his daughter was beside herself and demanded that he withdraw the lawsuit. He told her that he and her mother didn't know what to believe, but felt their relationship with their grandchildren needed to be protected. He asked her why she was forbidden to go near children. She refused to answer. He then told her that I suggested they file a lawsuit after our family dinner on Sunday night. Now we know why you weren't invited. He made us promise that we would sue all of you because he didn't want our relationship with our grandchildren to depend on the behavior of their parents. He himself gave us the address of your penthouse. This is how we learned where to notify you. According to city records, you're a co-owner with Glenn's boss, which gives his words a lot of credibility. Deborah got mad and he hung up. This conversation showed him a lot because human nature, when faced with the truth, tends to run away. Luckily, Friday was the last day of school before spring break. So my in-laws, my three kids, my mom and I went to Disney World for a week, flying out on Saturday and returning a week later. This trip was planned weeks in advance, but I was unable to get a refund on Deborah's ticket. Gordon convinced Deborah to sign a waiver for her share of the house instead of having her corporation bear some of the household expenses while we were married leading her to believe that it would not be considered a marital asset in the divorce. She didn't realize that her corporation would still be included because she operated it from her home and her business address was our place of residence. Walker's advertising management accepted the terms of my dismissal. Thus, until my sick and vacation days were exhausted, I remained an employee of the company. This gave me until the end of June to decide what I wanted to do next. When I returned, my former assistant Nora informed me that the board of directors was giving me time to cool off before trying to work with me. They realized how valuable I was to the firm and began to hear murmurs from clients wondering if I would return. Although the Walker brothers owned significant shares, the corporate structure allowed them both to be removed for cause. They could also be forced by the board of directors to sell all their shares, so the brothers hired an outside firm to evaluate their options and manage the damage. 
Gordon allowed Deborah access to the garage, where we moved all of her personal belongings while we were away after duplicating all of her corporation's paperwork, including all bank records. He hired a team of financial experts to calculate all the expenses of raising our children to this day, starting from the date of conception of the eldest child. Using a semi-annual interest rate, he divided each year's cost by three and came up with Stephen Walker's estimated share of my deception, doubling it for undue stress and anxiety, then adding interest to bring it to current values. The second suit against him was for alienation of affection. I also filed a lawsuit against both brothers for interfering with my marriage. I used the grounds of infidelity against my wife. The kids had just returned from school after their first day when there was a knock on our door. It was a social worker who was investigating a complaint that I was not caring for the children. I found out it came from my soon-to-be ex-wife's lawyer. My son Carl led her into the kitchen, where she found me and my daughters working together to prepare dinner. She could smell the roast cooking in the oven. When she explained why she was there, I suggested she look around the cabinets, refrigerator, and freezer while I continued peeling the potatoes. After she did what I asked, I offered her a cup of coffee and pulled out two large mugs. Miss, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, I said. Trisha Marsh, Mr. James, she replied. I asked her to call me Glenn and then suggested that if she had time, she could interview my children now because I assumed the court would order it. Since dinner will be ready in an hour, we'd love for you to join us if you can, she agreed. My son Carl took her into the living room and they talked while Tina and Terry helped me. After a pleasant dinner, Tricia talked with my daughters for quite some time. Carl and I washed the dishes together. None of the kids had done their homework, so I wrote them notes explaining why, in case anyone asked. Finally, Trisha and I were able to talk in private. The first thing I did was show her the chat between Stephen and Deborah. For 16 years you had no idea, Trisha said. They planned it all. It seemed she wanted children and he didn't, so they chose you to raise his children. That's about how I see it, I said. Makes me wonder if I ever knew the woman I was married to. I will add to my notes that the marriage was built throughout her life on lies on her part. The fact that they planned all this calls into question whether they had any love for children at all. Tricia explained, It seems like the kids and you are just an inconvenience they had to deal with. Your wife's lawyer is trying to make you look like you don't care about your children. Everything I've seen and heard over the past few hours contradicts this. I was surprised to hear that you told the children that Stephen was their biological father. It's good to see that all three of you have made it clear that they want to stay with you. Are you listed as the father on their birth certificates? Yes, I replied. Will this be important? Very important. This proves that you didn't know and acted as if the children were yours all along. This will carry a lot of weight in the eyes of the court when making a custody decision. Tricia said, I'll give you my email address so you can send me this clip because this is what the judge needs to see. Seeing situations like yours strengthens my conviction to never get married. I can't change the past, I said with a smile. Besides, I love my children, no matter who created them. They may not have my genes, but everything else about them is me. I like the way you look at it, Trisha said. I'll have to investigate your soon-to-be ex's place of residence and interview them both, but right now the odds are in your favor. The judge will take this into account in his report, I wrote. Glenn Allen James was chosen by Deborah because he was good enough to be the father of her children while they were growing up, but not good enough for her to allow him to be their biological father. Mr. James received legal proof that Mrs. James was in a common law relationship with Mr. to Stephen Walker before and during their actual marriage. We chatted for a few more hours, maintaining light conversation and exchanging cell phone numbers to keep in touch. She was surprised that Deborah had not attempted to contact the children since the notification on Sunday. She recorded this in her notes. I later learned that she called her detective friend to find out if a crime had been committed. He said there was but he thinks the district attorney should be consulted first to see if they want to prosecute the case. 
I'm lucky there was an election next year and the DAO will be running. I didn't realize then what a huge storm was gathering around my situation. I woke up Tuesday morning and got busy getting the kids ready for school. I was surprised that Trisha asked me to send the videotape I showed her to the assistant district attorney. I did even better. I emailed him all the clips and promised to send him any new ones if they appeared. Three hours later, they called me back. I was surprised when he explained that the court had already issued a warrant for wiretaps, etc., so that whatever I provided could be used legally in a criminal court without my name being revealed. It was a critical moment that all the clips came from an email address. This made it appear as if it was coming from a third party. He was going to build a case to charge them both with extortion, one charge for each year they had been running their scam on my children and me. I said I hoped the charges would be filed before I had to go to divorce court. When the kids got back, we ordered pizza and had an early dinner because I wanted to catch the local evening news. The local CBS affiliate captured the whole thing. Deborah and Stephen were detained for questioning as they left the restaurant after dinner. For the next hour, I answered calls and explained that I didn't know what was going on. The rest of the week passed quietly, or at least that's what I thought. Later I found out that I was wrong. On Wednesday I was seen entering the office building of my former employer's competitors. Nobody knew that I was meeting a friend for lunch. The gossip pages of the next day's morning paper mentioned that I was in talks with senior management to accept the position. I called the author of the article and said that if she went back to the old notes, she might mistakenly name the twin with whom my wife was at the theater. Notice the words, date night. She asked me how my meeting went. I replied that my lawyer advised me not to comment at this time. Then things got interesting. I dropped the kids off at school and had just gotten home Friday morning when Deborah got out of her car as I walked from the side of the street. She was wearing a t-shirt and blue jeans. Her face looked sad and exhausted. She was without makeup and it was amazing. She never left the house without makeup. Seeing her in this state reminded me that I should check my new computer to see what the cameras had sent. I walked to the side of the road. Glenn, Deborah said. My parents don't even want to talk to me. They told me not to contact them until I solved the mess I created. My brothers and sisters told me the same thing. I want to see the children. For what? I asked. As far as I know, you haven't even called them. I called them that Sunday. They all told me they didn't want to talk to me and hung up. I think they might have cooled down now, Deborah said. I have a lot of explaining to do. I will talk to my lawyer about setting up supervised meetings. Nothing more, I said coldly. I will also inform him that you violated the restraining order. Thank you, she replied, Deborah. You and I will need to sit down and talk about all this. There's nothing to discuss. We can prove that the only reason you got married was because Stephen didn't want to take on the responsibility of being a man and raising his children. That's why you needed a fool to take this place. That's why you and him chose me, I said sternly. Our whole marriage was a lie. It had to be this way. No person would do what you did out of love. How long did you two laugh at me? I guess congratulations are in order since I heard that Stephen and you are going to get married as soon as we get divorced. Throughout my tirade, her face did not change. Her response to my comments spoke volumes. We are not together. Stephen had to find a new place to live. We were both notified of a restraining order against each other while being interviewed by detectives until the investigation was completed. Now he has to stay in a hotel, Deborah said. My lawyer screwed up by filing a complaint against you with Child Protective Services. They interviewed us. The condominium management company is demanding that we sell the unit. The kids and I were interviewed on Monday, I explained. The interviewer had private conversations with each of us, so I don't know what they told her children are at an age when the court will allow them to choose who to live with. They'll be with your parents this weekend. Without saying goodbye, I turned around and entered the house. Taking the laptop, I went to the kitchen. After brewing new coffee, I opened it. I've learned a lot since Monday. 
the HR representative used Roger's office to conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with management from the top to the bottom. It was sad to find out how many people laughed at me behind my back. Many were fired with the wording, for the cause. This was a godsend for my lawyer and the district attorney. It was revealed that Stephen often used bribes, promotions, and blackmail to keep his relationship a secret. All these crimes were subject to punishment. The board of directors and the CEO met late Thursday after most employees had left work. The council was provided with complete information about who knew what, when and why everything happened. Even former employees were interviewed. They discussed what to do with Stephen and Robert. Stephen was stripped of his position as president of the firm, and Roger was suspended. The head of HR told the CEO that I had been seen entering a commercial building and that reliable sources, a gossip reporter, had confirmed that I had been contacted by competitors. The CEO smiled and said, but can they offer him the position of president? The head of HR picked up the phone, explaining that she was going to find out if Nora was still working. The CEO asked why. Nora was Glenn's assistant. She knows him better than anyone. So she could have an idea of his thoughts. Glenn. Then it dawned on me. According to state laws, a civil marriage that has existed for more than a year is considered to be official. I picked up the phone and called the Dawes office. I explained my idea and he liked it. According to the law, Deborah could be immediately charged with bigamy if their relationship was proven. I gave them Gordon's office number and told them to ask him for copies of all our documents. Two hours later Gordon called me. Damn it, Glenn, I didn't notice it, but I should have. This is genius. Your divorce is a grand slam and Deborah will be blamed within hours. George Davidson, who is leading the Dawes investigation of the two, said you brought the question up. I withdraw your suit for divorce. Instead, we are now going for an annulment because legally she was already married. All that remains is to iron out the details, I said. And it will be easy if Deborah ends up in jail, Gordon laughed. It's funny that with all their plans and schemes, it's their own behavior that will destroy them, making our other claims even stronger. By the way, wait until I post the rest of what I found. Call the Dawes office to see if your wiretap permit can be extended. If possible, it will save me thousands in legal fees, I said. Indicate that in the next lettery will not provide evidence of criminal acts. It may not be necessary, I ask that she be assigned to pay your legal expenses, Gordon replied. Glenn, are you serious? I have copies of confessions from employees and former employees about what Stephen did to hide his common-law marriage. I'll send them to you too, I said. I went back to my laptop and opened a clip of the CEO, CFO, and head of HR. They all agreed that I had a compelling case. They could try to protect themselves from him, but publicity and interest in the case would ruin their reputation. They agreed to try to settle it as cheaply as possible. Within five minutes, the Dawes office and my lawyer received all the video clips I received via email. Nora called me. Hello, stranger. Long time no see. How are you? She said. Glenn, this is a complete mess. There is not a single department that is not affected. The HR department conducts individual interviews with everyone. They had a notary come to witness and confirm. We've lost some good people. Some were fired, others left on their own, Nora said. Stephen and Robert were called. After meeting with the CEO, security allowed Stephen to collect his items from his desk before escorting him out. Robert was told he was being suspended from all duties until his future was decided. Is your job safe? I asked. In my resignation letter, I said that you were the most qualified to fill my position. They told me that, right now I am acting as interim. A final decision will not be made until the council finds a new president. The only thing they told me was that the person they were interested in had a situation that needed to be resolved. My gut tells me it's you. After all, Stephen and Robert never did anything without consulting you first. Well, they learned it the hard way and at great cost that half the time they heard but didn't listen. I simplified processes by focusing on the important things, ignoring the frills that our clients often thought were important. When they saw the final product, 
they were happy with the results, I said. My phone hasn't stopped ringing since I left, but I'm not agreeing to anything yet. Thank you, Glenn. You told me what I wanted to know without saying anything. Are you still open to coming back? said Nora. Depends, I laughed. Can you email me the gossip reporter's address if you have one? No problem, but I'll text it to you, Nora replied. Using an email address that no one knew, I sent all the video clips not related to my divorce to a gossip reporter. Every little detail she can squeeze out of them will go public in print. Without naming names, she wrote in such a way that there was no doubt about who she was talking about. The writer was a master of her craft. My son came running from the living room while I was preparing dinner. Dad, Mom on early news. I went in and rewinded to see what was happening. She was escorted in handcuffs. The next shot showed a representative announcing that she had been charged with bigamy. Could she go to jail on this charge if she is found guilty? asked Carl. Yes, this is considered a crime in our state. How long she will sit depends on the judge, I replied. My father always told me, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. It stopped me from doing a lot of stupid things when I was your age. How long will they keep her? asked the son. Until she gets in front of a judge and can post bail, I replied. Depending on the department, she may already be free. Carl and Carla took the children. On Saturday, the boys will go to a monster truck show. The girls would be playing two soccer games, and I needed to get out of the house. I can't believe it, said Carl. Deborah has been arrested for bigamy. She could get up to ten years, depending on the judge. I know, Dad, and this is not the end, I answered. It appears her lover used bribes, threats, and blackmail to keep their relationship a secret. The Da obtained video evidence from some of Stephen's victims. I felt sorry for Carl because his daughter must have torn his heart out. Suddenly, I was left alone. I shouldn't have because I was mentally and emotionally depressed. I wonder if this is called bottoming. I sat on the stairs and cried, and my body wouldn't let me stop. Some say depression is a form of healing or adjustment. If this is healing, then what is hell? The human body and its emotions are a fragile thing. No matter what we plan as humans, we cannot control when and how it will find its own release. Three hours later, I was sitting in a local park, throwing unsalted nuts to squirrels, not knowing what to do. Most people don't realize how lonely divorce can be. Those whom you considered friends distance themselves for their own protection, others because they do not know what to believe. Then there is any difference between being single and all your friends being married. Being single meant that you no longer fit in in many situations. I was lost in my thoughts, completely unprepared for what was happening around me. I did not see or hear the person who sat down at the other end of the bench. I saw you sitting here and watched you for a while. It became obvious that squirrels seemed to be your best friends. I was wondering if you realized this and how you were coping, Glenn. Looks like I found out. Trisha Marsh said, Blue melancholy is terrible, isn't it? You need to find your own way to shake it out. Easier said than done. I'm learning that divorce is something you have to go through alone. Most of your friends avoid you like it's contagious, I replied. Come on, let me buy you some coffee, Tricia said. No talk about business, okay? I agreed. I found out that Tricia was going shopping, so I joined her. It was interesting to know her tastes in food. She bought mostly frozen prepared foods for herself because, having no one to cook for, she lost interest. I knew my mother had it that way. The problem is that along with this, their diet also suffered. I was carrying a basket of groceries, and she saw me select a few items. When we reached the deli counter, I asked the clerk for twelve fresh wontons and a quarter pound of barbecue duck. I hope you like wonton soup, I said because that's what I'm making for dinner, if you agree. It works for me since we're only two blocks from my apartment, Tricia said. After we washed the vegetables, she watched me cut them into equal portions. I told her I was using chicken broth because the wantons I chose contained more pork than beef. I then sliced the pre-chopped duck in the same manner. She took out two pans. I filled one with water with a little salt, the other with broth. 
Once the broth was boiling, I added the corn, water chestnuts, spices, and duck. I saved the red, yellow, and green peppers and snow peas for last. Once the salt water came to a boil, I added the wantons to cook them. Before draining the wantons once they were cooked, I added fresh vegetables to the soup, then poured two cups of soy sauce on top. After tasting it, I added some garlic powder. Finally, I added the wantons to the rest to soak up the flavor of the soup. Then I served it. As soon as Trisha tasted the first spoonful, she was hooked. I made enough for several servings, hoping she could reheat the rest. As we talked, she learned that I prefer to make my own wantons in large batches and freeze them. Another trick I explained is to use slightly less broth and add cornstarch as a thickener to make a stew that can be served with rice. When she found out how much I spent, she was shocked. I left her in a good mood. Trisha accepted me for who I am. Surprisingly, this is exactly what I needed all this time. Recognizing who you are means a lot, and today it moved mountains. On Sunday, while reading the morning newspaper, I noticed that a gossip reporter had published a two-page article about the former president's ongoing efforts to maintain power and control over his personal situation. This included things like promotions, blackmail, and bribery. She ended with the question, is this being investigated? If not, why not? I sent Trisha a message asking if she wanted to spend the day with me at Kanai Island. She agreed. We acted like teenagers on our first date. I wondered why she was never married. She explained that her career always got in the way. Constantly calling into work in the middle of something has killed the relationship several times. I could understand it from both sides, given what my career had done to my marriage. My parents-in-law and my children were surprised at my good mood when I met them at Sunday dinner. Everyone commented that they hadn't seen me this happy for several weeks. Nora called on Monday morning to let me know that I could expect a quick visit from the chairman of the board to begin negotiations for my return. The article that appeared in the Sunday newspaper forced them to do this because everyone knew who it was writing about. Nora said the board was going to take legal action to force the sale of Stephen and Robert's shares because they refused to sell after they were sacked. An unexpected call came from Deborah requesting a private meeting in a neutral location without cell phones. I asked her to give me 10 minutes to think and call me back. I called Gordon, who said that sometimes the best place to have a private conversation is in the middle of a crowd where people can move freely. As a result, I met Deborah at the Nathan's Hot Dog stand in the park at 1 p.m. We found a bench. We took out our phones and turned them off, leaving them in plain sight. What do you want, Deborah? I asked coldly. I need to know if you know who is doing this to Stephen and me, Deborah said bluntly. The gossip journalist is pushing the police, almost leading them. The corporation that Stephen founded kicked him out. Robert thinks he's being kicked out too, and now you filed for an annulment. Well, Stephen's problems, I think, come from the board of directors. I was told that this is where information comes to the police. This led them to discover facts and witnesses to events, I said. I can't discuss anything related to our case because my lawyer doesn't want me to. So why did you agree to meet me then? asked Deborah. You know that we have dug a huge hole for ourselves. I am told that Miss Marsh gave her report to the court late last week. We have been informed that all the children want to stay with you. I have to agree with what Stephen and I are facing now. Another lawyer says I could face serious time if the judge decides that I was legally married to Stephen. For him, it all comes down to interpretation as to whether this is a marriage because we don't have a marriage certificate. I will need to tell the children that I saw you today, I replied. They will ask my opinion about what you look like. How are they coping emotionally? Deborah asked with real concern. They have their moments. It can be hard because I can't explain or answer their questions, I said. What questions? Deborah asked, hoping for an opportunity to come back into their lives. What did they do to deserve such punishment? I answered. Even I sometimes wondered about this. You should write a book about being married to two men for almost 20 years and make it as sexy as possible. With so much interest, it will be a bestseller. Having said this, I got up and left. 
Deborah was Deborah, always thinking of herself first. She was like an old dog, too accustomed to her habits to ever change. Even worse, I couldn't feel sorry for her because I realized that all my remaining feelings for her had died. I returned home and checked my email and, to my surprise, found a video of our conversation. Deborah's voice and my conversation were clear and precise. I forwarded it to the gossip reporter with a big smile on my face. On Tuesday, a gossip column reported in large print that Deborah James, accused of bigamy, was planning to write a tell-all book about her 18 years living with two husbands. This news made Carl and Carla Matthews even more angry because their daughter seemed proud of what she had done. Gordon called me on Wednesday evening with good news. It was a successful day in divorce court. The divorce judge agreed that under state law, she was already married to Stephen at the time of our marriage. Since our marriage was not legal, an annulment was granted. This gave him some flexibility in asset allocation. Although Deborah's lawyer fought tooth and nail, the judge ruled that since her first spouse was not named in this divorce and it was part of a scam, I get my share. I was given temporary sole custody until her criminal issues were resolved, but I had to give her unrestricted access to the children. Stephen Walker was arrested Friday, and suddenly many of those he had mistreated over the years found themselves in a situation where they needed to cooperate with the Dawes office. Deborah's life took a turn for the worse. A few months ago, she had two lovers who kept her warm at night. Now she had no one. I was busy landscaping around the house when the chairman of the board of directors showed up. We need to have a serious one-on-one -on -one talk about this mess, Glenn. I hope you had enough time, Bill Burroughs said. I stood up and offered Bill my hand. He shook it. It was never about the company, I said. It was all about the people in it. A huge smile appeared on his face. Thank you. That's what I needed to hear. Let's see if we can do something. We went into my kitchen and started discussing my situation. I learned a few things, and so did Bill. What impressed me most was his honesty. He didn't hide anything. It was gratifying to hear that once they filed suit to force the sale of their shares, the brothers agreed to exchange their common stock for preferred stock. The move effectively stripped them of their voting rights in the company. I told him that was one of my concerns. He went through each layoff one by one and explained why and who left. I told him that I would like to try to get some of them back if I go back because they were caught in a situation like I was. You can't blame people for something they didn't know. I was surprised by the amount offered on behalf of the firm to settle the claim. I called Gordon, who spoke to Bill. I told Gordon to accept it. After that, he pulled out a contract for the position of president of the company and handed it to me. I know you won't sign anything until your lawyer gets the settlement check, Bill said. While you're waiting for this process to complete, study this. I think you'll be more than pleased. After he left, I was surprised by the timing. We talked for more than three hours. I called Tricia, hoping she wasn't busy tonight. She was not. I asked her if she wanted to join my family for a celebration dinner. What are we celebrating? She asked. My divorce, gaining custody, settling a lawsuit against my former firm, and my eventual return to work, she agreed. I made a reservation at a restaurant with a small private room for eight o'clock in the evening. I called my in-laws, my mother, my sister, and her husband, who all agreed to come. I told my sister to bring her children. I called Trichito to say I'll pick her up at seven. On the way to Trisha's, I stopped at the store to buy a mix of red and yellow roses and ferns in a cute vase. To thank her for everything she did, the kids teased me on the way to her house, discussing what they liked about her. I left the kids in the car, walking up to her apartment after she let me in. Trisha loved the flowers and looked gorgeous. Trisha Marsh wore a cute summer yellow dress. Her blue eyes sparkled with surprise. She prepared to make a good impression, and she did it. Since you brought flowers, Trisha said with a laugh, does that mean you consider this our first date? I didn't know what to say, so when I tried to speak, I faltered. Trisha smiled and took my hand, holding it. It's been a long time since I made a man speechless, Trisha said with a smile. I'll take that as a yes. I will not forget this moment to this day.
We got into the car, and the kids started telling her about my custody win. I told her who else was coming to the celebration. Trisha said, Wow, meeting the family on our first official date. My oldest daughter Tammy, who takes after Grandma Carla, said she loved the flowers her dad bought for her. Trisha showed her the image she had taken, and it became her background screen. Thanks to traffic jams, we arrived ten minutes late. I pre-ordered two bottles of the best medium champagne. Before I could introduce her, Terry, my youngest daughter, said, Everyone, this is Trisha Marsh, our dad's girlfriend. And Trisha and I burst out laughing. This set the mood for the evening. Over dinner, I explained the court's decision and its rulings to everyone. Then he talked about the upcoming settlement of the lawsuit against the firm and the removal of Robert and Stephen Walker from their positions. The latest news was that I was offered the position of president. Tricia explained that she was a social services representative called to investigate a complaint against me, and that's how we met. Carl stood up with a glass of champagne in his hand. After everything you've been through, Glenn, Carla, and I were worried that you would cut us out of your life. Instead, you brought us closer. Congratulations, you're finally getting the respect you deserve. A toast to Glenn for being who he is and to Tricia for making him happy again. As we were all getting ready to leave, Carl pulled me aside and told me they were taking the kids for the weekend. They use their keys to get everything they need. Don't waste time on the past. Start building your new life. I asked Tricia if she liked to dance and off we went. I took her home at 3 o'clock in the morning, agreeing to pick her up at noon. We spent most of the weekend together. On Monday morning, after sending the kids off to school, I looked at the proposal for the first time. It more than doubled my previous salary, had built-in stock bonuses if certain conditions were met, and a lift bonus that gave me two options, cash or common stock. Bill has already signed it. I called a business lawyer and made an appointment to have him review all the legal terms to make sure I didn't miss anything. At 10 in the morning, while I was doing laundry, there was a knock on our door. I was surprised to see a small Asian woman when I opened the door. My first thought was, the last thing I needed was Jehovah's Witnesses on my doorstep. Her name was Lin Wong, better known as a gossip journalist. After introducing myself, I invited her to enter. Coffee or tea, I asked. She said, if you have a good strong gin, this will do. It's early for me, but okay. I poured it for her and, like a gentleman, joined in by opening the beer. Sorry to bother you, Mr. James, she said, but I have a video I want to show you. I suggested that she start. I learned that this was a video recording of my conversation with Deborah. She then turned on a conversation where my wife stated that she never intended to write a book. She wanted a retraction so she could begin an appeal against the divorce decision. Mr. James, I need your opinion before I decide to publish. Lin Wong explained. I told her to turn on her recording device and let me know when it was safe to start. She made it. Mrs. Pai Wong, first of all, you can use my name. What you showed me was only part of our conversation that day. We also discussed other things such as our children and divorce. Over 18 years of marriage to her, I learned that everything she told me was a lie, so I can't say she's telling the truth now. I explained. Since everything she told me was a lie, I have to wonder if she lied to you too. I can't say I didn't lie, and that makes the situation even sadder. Since I was not worthy of her honesty, for me she is not worth lying about. I hope this clears things up for you. She replied, yes, that clears it up, and turned off the device. I think I'll use my column to make a poll. I will write her conversation with me word for word, she said, and below it our conversation that we just finished. I'll ask the readers who they believe. Looking forward to it? I answered sincerely. My father always believed that if you give a man enough rope, he will eventually hang himself. Deborah confirmed that he was right. For her, it was all about the money she was losing. I knew it. I think Mrs. Ro Wong saw it too. My ex-wife called and said she wanted to take the kids to dinner. I said that they would all be home just after four o'clock and that she could come then. She came soon after that. My eldest daughter answered the door. I heard her shout, 
Our ex-mother has arrived. And I heard the sound of running feet. I stayed in the kitchen, not wanting to be accused of interfering with the children's relationship with their mother. A few minutes later, I heard the front door close. Soon after, the children entered the kitchen. We told her it's too early, Dad, Tammy said. Because it is. We can't accept what she did to all of us. We told her this. I pointed out that if I did something against a friend, Terry said, I would likely lose the friendship for life, and she wants us to act like nothing happened. I just told her to go to hell, Carl said. She asked who gave me the right to say that. I said to my grandfather. To change the subject, I suggested going to McDonald's for dinner. Everyone agreed. After the kids finished their homework, I called Trich and explained what happened. She said I shouldn't have been surprised. Even though you hit it well, they saw how much you were hurting. It looked like Stephen's legal troubles were catching up with him. He told his legal team to settle the case as cheaply as possible. Robert sued me for damage to his face. On Friday, after my lawyer made some changes, I signed the contract and called Bill. We agreed to announce this next Friday. I reported this to the gossip reporter. My mother decided to take the children for the weekend. Tricia was busy with something else. I devoted my free time to finding some of the people who had left. Two whom I considered key to my turnaround plans agreed to return as soon as I showed them my new contract if the head of HR left or was removed. I learned that they had approached her with a warning about Stephen's actions and they had been ignored. It was really interesting to read Mrs. Wong's comments. After publishing conversations with Deborah and I word for word, she asked readers for their thoughts. She then wrote, Meeting these two made me wonder what Deborah ever saw in Glenn. He comes across as a kind, loving, and considerate man. The type that every woman wants. Deborah is a huntress, always seeking more thrills and power from those she can never find happiness with. She will be whoever you want her to be because she doesn't know herself and isn't comfortable in her skin. She wears a mask with everyone she meets, and it's not makeup on her face. Deborah James used Stephen Walker the same way he used her. For them, that's what made their relationship work. Reading this, I thought she hit the nail on the head. On Monday, I contacted the agency looking for a housekeeper for Monday Friday. With my new salary level, I could afford it. I called the chairman of the board of directors, telling him about my discovery. Upon learning that they were telling the truth, she was fired. While talking to Tricia that night, I asked her if she knew anyone who was burning out at their job. She asked why. I explained that I was looking for a head of HR since the current one had been fired. She said she knew two who would be perfect in this area. I told her to ask them both to contact me. On Friday morning, the last Friday of May, the chairman of the board of directors introduced me as the new president in front of the media. I told the press that our company had experienced a personnel crisis and was emerging with a new team. I introduced the two new vice presidents, explaining that both had left because of the behavior of previous management. I said that this kind of honesty from all our employees is what we want from now on. I introduced the new head of HR, emphasizing that we were the first to hire a former social worker for this position because we wanted to develop moral and mental standards much higher than before. I asked Nora Richards, my former assistant, to stand. We are pleased to announce that Nora Richards has been appointed to the newly created position of vice president, overseeing all aspects of production for our commercial team, I said. Nora received thunderous applause. Thus, the message was sent that dedication and hard work mean something. Deborah fought the bigamy charge and lost, serving a sentence of two years minus one day. Stephen settled all claims and is serving ten years. Robert is appealing his defeat for the third time. Tricia Marsh and I are dating and the kids are pushing us to set a wedding date. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click 